Hi, this is uh, Chris Columbus, the director of uh, Home Alone, along with... I'm Macaulay Culkin. I'm the, the little little boy in it. <laughs> and you may notice a change in uh, vocal uh, range, yeah, just, Macaulay. Just the tone. <laughs> hey, that's you. That's me. Um, so this was, a, uh, I guess we, uh, w we could start about uh, talking about the beginning of how this whole movie came about, really. Um... I was I was in dire straits at the time in terms of my career. I had just come off of a complete uh, disaster, a big bomb. And I didn't know if I was actually going to direct again. I thought I'd have to go back to writing. So I was in Chicago staying at my in-law's house. And my first daughter uh, was just born. And John Hughes sent me, out of the kindness of his heart, two scripts. One was called Reach the Rock and the other was called Home Alone. One of them, it was rumored, and I think it was this one, was written over a weekend. Um, <laughs> Which some critics would probably jump on the bandwagon. And yeah, say, exactly. Well, we, we always knew that. Um, <laughs> so I read Home Alone and uh, immediately responded to it. I thought it was just a, a great, uh, great piece of material, and it, it it talked about some of the things that I was interested in making a film about. And we had a meeting. I remember uh -huh. some in New York. I just it was you and my father were talking most of the time, and I was just imitating everything you were doing. Everything I was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You drink your water, I drink my water, like that. I think I did that. I think I way overdid it. I think I just kept doing it <laughs> the whole like hour. Well, you know, the interesting thing is we again. It was this kind of situation where we looked at hundreds of kids again, and I was, I was like, even though I didn't know if I'd ever direct a film again, I was like, well, you know, Macaulay was in Uncle Buck, and I don't want to just cast him based on. John Hughes producing the movie because then it looks like I'm going to give in to John Hughes and I'm going to be a wimp and uh, I met all these I met hundreds of kids and when I met Macaulay there was just no one else who came close uh, to to what we needed for this film I mean really in terms of an actor a, a child actor at the time you're the most unique original kid I'd ever seen so that was pretty well thank you yeah I mean I, mean, I totally agree with you but thank you anyway <laughs> uh, but it really is a, it's it's sort of uh, because it was the it was the fact that you um, the camera loved you. Obviously, you see these, uh, you see the shots from the film. The camera loved you, but at the same time, uh, you were relatable to every kid in in America because you weren't an idealized version of a kid. Kids are so used to accustomed to seeing the, the, this ridiculously Shirley Temple and the curls yeah. and the whole thing. You and know, there was just something enormously real about you. Then I could remember my lines, and I had a lot of energy. <laughs> that is true. You did have a lot of energy, uh, almost a sad amount of energy. Which is, uh, I mean. <laughs> Still do too. Uh, now, do you uh, do you remember like this particular scene? We're starting from the beginning uh, of the film, and I'm just curious because there were so many scenes in the film. We were talking before we started, th where we would shoot your coverage first, mm -hmm. and then we'd have to send you home, or else I'd child still be labor in jail. laws. Yeah. Yes, I'm still well versed in the child labor laws. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> there are obviously certain elements of the film, like this. Do you remember this being shot? No, well, because you weren't here. I, I remember we did the whole. There was a whole sequence with the you know. People coming up the stairs, down the stairs, and right. he's there, and the pizza guy's there. I remember that, and uh -huh. just like you know, trying to coordinate that whole thing. But no, in general, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of holes in it mm -hmm. in my memory. Um, and this guy went on to do something on Nickelodeon. My kids uh, know him. Yeah, Pete and Pete. Yeah, Pete and Pete. Yeah. Uh, is he, is it still on the air? No, no. Right. It lasted a couple of years. It's actually right. a really kind of neat show. Yeah, my kids love that show. Uh, but what was interesting about the whole look of this film, I guess we can talk about it a little bit. You'll, you'll even notice, some people will think, well, this wasn't intentional, but we intended the film to feel like Christmas, sort of. I wanted the house to feel very warm. You look greens at and reds. Macaulay's wearing green, a green and red shirt. There's a green and red a uh, jumper sweater on this guy back here. The wallpaper is That's all very clever. All conveying a warmth <laughs> of Christmas and something that uh, it just uh, it was interesting to us. So it wouldn't be too far over the top, but it would feel warm. I wanted the house to feel like a warm place. Joe Pesci. What, what do you remember about Joe Pesci? What is like your first? My first man. <laughs> gosh, I don't even. I, I have. A, I still show this. I have a scar on my finger. Uh huh. We'll get to that part near the end. <laughs> <laughs> when okay. uh, you know, he says, uh, you know, I'm gonna bite each one of your fingers off one uh -huh. at a time. And during rehearsal, he actually bit my finger a little harder than I think he thought he did. And I still have a little scar on my finger. It's my little Joe Pesci tooth mark. I'm telling you something. <laughs> I believe, and I know Joe uh, would probably uh, get a little upset with me about this, but there's a little professional jealousy from a lot of the actors on the set because you were the star. 
star. There was this little kid who was the star who we were all paying an enormous amount of attention to who was carrying the film. And uh, there was a lot of passive-aggressive stuff going on. And I don't think Joe meant to bite through your fingers. But heck, you know, you but, never uh, know. He was not <laughs> particularly happy during the course of making this film. Huh. And uh, I, don't, I, don't th I think he would probably say the same thing. He had just come off of... Goodfellas, Goodfellas and Raging Bull, you know. and he was, uh, I don't know, did he win the Academy Award? He, he, he won for Goodfellas. I see. His acceptance speech was, thanks, and that was it. Okay, well, there you go. So, um, <laughs> And when he, I remember, I was such a fan of his, asking him to do uh, the Goodfellas, uh, the clown speech, you know, mm -hmm. make me laugh, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why do I, am I funny to you, like a clown? And he, uh, he would do that every day, and it was great. But at the same time, I could feel it from the actors, there was, because there's always a sense of uh, rivalry between actors, there was this feeling of, you were the star of this movie, and that was uncom That was not really common at the time. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, created an interesting tension on the set, I have to say. Yeah, see, I never really felt that, but I was, I was nine. Everyone around here knows he did it. Now it'll just be a matter of time before he does it again. What's he doing now? He walks up and down the streets every night, salting the sidewalks. Maybe he's just trying to be nice. No way. See that garbage can full of salt? That's where he keeps his victims. The salt turns the bodies into mummies. Wow. So th this, uh, uh, what, what was interesting about a lot of this movie is we would always put fake snow down. The foam and the stuff. The foam, and th that's really, uh, we had a Wisconsin ski, uh, a, a bunch of guys who worked at a ski resort in Wisconsin put down snow. But That poor statue. And the statue was a, a running gag, and this guy, a lot, of, a lot of this movie was made on an extremely small budget. At the time, How are your kids doing, huh? the picture was uh, at, 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 at one studio. And that studio didn't want to make the movie because of a $2 million difference, and uh, it went over to 20th Century Fox. And we still, were, we still made the film for a little, a little above $18 million, which at the time was still a small budget. So we had to make things stretch, which we'll talk about through the course of the, uh, of the picture. One of the great things, though, about working with Pesci, I have to say, is his improvisational skills were terrific. And it was because of his training with Scorsese that uh, even on a picture like Home Alone really comes in handy. He's, he's a very funny guy, Joe. Yeah. And his comedic instincts were really something I had never seen before. Little snippets in, in uh, pictures like Raging Bull and Goodfellas, but his, his, uh, his ability to improvise was just phenomenal. And then John Hurd. I cast John Hurd because John Hurd was someone I was always a big fan of. He was in this picture called Cutter. It was called Cutter and Bone. Now it's called Cutter's Way. And his performance in Cutter's Way, he should have gotten an Academy Award. I've never seen it. It's uh, uh, Jeff Bridges and John Hurd, and he is just amazing in that film. So I was a huge fan, and it was always a dream to work with him. He also did this old film uh, called Head Over Heels, and he was, he was kind of a leading man back in his day. He's just a wonderful actor. And, and, and another guy who didn't really know why he was in this movie. At the time, he was sort of like, why am I doing this? I this remember is... feeling a, a certain amount of discomfort. From yeah, him, he was like, know, "Why yeah. do I have to do this? Why am I in this kids' movie?" You know, mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a good, and understandable. No one really knew what this movie had the potential of becoming. We'd always hoped it would be successful, but we never knew. Um, I always knew. You, <laughs> you always had an idea. I always knew. Now this scene. Do you remember coming in on a Saturday to rehearse this scene? Yeah, we had to rehearse this because it was so. Which is so chaotic with everybody. Uh -huh. We ate so much pizza. I didn't want to eat lunch. <laughs> and this is something that was interesting. We, you'll notice, it's a, there's a rare shot in the film where this is your brother. Yeah, there he is. How, did, how are you guys? He's working now. Right? Oh, yeah, he's yeah. Very he's, well. he's doing very good, very well for himself. Um, this is uh, typical of the style of this movie. Not the vomiting, obviously, but the... Uh, <laughs> uh, the the, the separation of actors in certain scenes because Macaulay's um, time was so valuable we needed to shoot uh, Macaulay separately and sometimes the other kids as well so you'll, you'll always see uh, I tried to block sequences where I could sort of keep Macaulay off by himself and keep the other actors in another space so I could shoot people separately child labor laws again child labor laws <laughs> And we're, and uh, uh, Kiri had to reshoot the the chair in the face. I remember. Oh yeah. Like he had to come back later, and he he was upset that he had to get his hair cut like fuller again. Oh, he was. <laughs> well, he uh, we we made a special very light rubber chair, so when it yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, that's I remember that. 
Catherine O'Hara was someone who I had uh, just loved her work on Second City TV. Yeah. I mean, I was, uh, aside from Saturday Night Live at the time in the 70s, Second City TV was the uh, sort of the place where you learned about comedy. And for me, it was, uh, it, I, I was just such a huge fan. So it was, again, a, a real honor to be able to work with her on both, both of these films. Yeah, no, she's incredible. I mean, this is the stuff she's doing now, you know. She's do oh, with oh, it's great. Chris it's Forget. great stuff. Transferred to Paris last summer, and both of his kids are still going to school here. And I guess he missed the whole family. He's giving us. Well, you got a pretty good cast. Yeah, it's kind of interesting <laughs> for a film that. Uh, but we treated it. You know, the weird thing about this film, and the and the, the the reason I think the film has kind of stood the test of time for a lot of kids is because that we always treated it with respect. We mm -hmm. never felt that we were making a movie for kids. We were making a movie. For the parents as well, it had never, a lot of appeal. Yeah. And he never, and he wanted to treat, he wanted the photography to, to to have a certain elegance about it, and the camera to be moving. And it was really never. Th so many times today, people try to make kids movies, and they they always cheapen them. And we never, I mean, certainly we got cheap with our jokes. Let's not <laughs> let's not pretend that. Oh we, yeah, no, we I mean it's it's three stooges. Anything you know? for yeah. anything for a laugh. I don't want a super phone. You know about him. He wets the bed. He'll pee all over me. That's why. I, that's also the reason I got the part. I'm, I'm such a ham. You're such a ham. <laughs> such a ham. <laughs> <laughs> but what's amazing is, at the time, I was only the father of a, of an infant, really. My yeah, daughter it was Rory's was a, age, yeah. but they were both born the same month. Yeah, and uh, I, so I was, uh, I, I thought, well, he's, this kid is really kind of over the top in terms of the way he treats his family. He's kind of a brat. Mm -hmm. Little did I realize, and after four children later, that this is kind of <laughs> par for the course, yes. the way kids just treat their parents. <laughs> John knew what he was talking about. Oh, yeah, he, he, had, he had lived through it. John, the meetings on this film. I hope I never see any church we would we would be in pre-production before we'd shoot, and then I would have to go to John was a night owl, so I'd have to go to John with the John Hughes's house from about nine at night to five in the morning. Mm -hmm. I would get home and get a half hour sleep and go back to the to the set. It mm -hmm. was just insane, Jeez. and he liked to work those hours, and we. So, uh, that's how we basically worked on the script and worked on the production design, and it was uh, it was literally a twenty four hour a day job. Now, oddly enough. You know, which is going to sound odd to some people. This, all of this, this sort of imagery was was uh, inspired by David Lean's Great Expectations. Hmm. So I was uh, obviously we didn't uh, fully get to that point, uh, uh, but but some of the black and white photography in that film uh, really inspired this sequence for me. <laughs> Branch was never particularly one of my favorite shots. It's always looked a little fake. Right now, whatever, <laughs> we can never get it right. We never had the money. To spend <laughs> Movie magic. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Movie magic from 17 years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to believe. It really is. Now this guy uh, was my driver. Yeah. I have a nasty habit of casting my drivers in my films. A lot both of these of guys the, are transport. Bo both of those two guys are transport. And uh, that guy was Pete, who drove me every day to both Home Alone films. This is a good place to bring up the score of the film. John uh, Williams was not the original composer. If you have one of the early posters of Home Alone, which you probably got a couple in your attic somewhere. Somewhere. It says, composer Bruce Broughton. And Bruce Broughton was the original composer on a, on a film that I wrote called Young Sherlock Holmes. And I, I loved his score for that film, so I met with him and hired him for this. He was not available to do this, and... Uh, he, he uh, essentially was doing The Rescuers Down Under. I think that's what it was. So we lost him. So we had no composer while we were shooting. Uh, the second half of this film, and we went to John Williams, thinking he'll never do a film like this. But he saw he saw the film, loved it, and decided to. It's amazing what he did. His too. score is unbelievable. Yeah. His score is beautiful. He doesn't miss. No. Well, the thing is, comedy is very difficult to score because it can always sound stupid or goofy, mm -hmm. and and John never really, never really let that happen. I, th I think one of the one of the great things about John Hughes' screenplay here is that John really filled in every possible logic yeah. hole here. Little this, loophole. Yeah. Any, you know, in other words, by putting this kid into the back of the van, he took care of the fact that you the would head be count, count. The head count worked. Also adding Buzz here, confusing her, mm -hmm. just added to the, I don't want to say the reality, because the film has a certain heightened reality sense, but the, the reality of what's going on. Yeah, and how and, it all happened. And the audience always bought it. They mm -hmm. bought the fact, particularly we were, we were concerned about mothers, because mothers would say, how can you leave your kid alone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no way on earth we're going to make this plane. It leaves in 45 minutes. Think positive, Frank. Uh, you be positive. I'll be realistic. 
If only they could imagine what plane travel would be like. <laughs> I know it's <laughs> 17 years in the future. No fluids, no liquids. <laughs> I know, and this is uh, this predates cell phones as well. So yeah. obviously, the whole picture would have been. <laughs> it would have ended right here. Right here, <laughs> the end. <laughs> in a pear tree. We actually shot a lot of this film on location in Chicago. This was shot at the at O'Hare Airport, actually. That was just chaos. Because it was, it was still a functioning airport while we were yeah. running through it. And uh, the key is here is uh, we were shooting... When we were shooting the fir this first picture, no one knew who Macaulay was. Uh, and... It, in contrast with shooting Home Alone 2, where there were busloads of people following him around. Crazy. You, you yeah. suddenly became one of the Beatles, um, which was a whole different vibe in terms of... We wouldn't have been able to shoot the way, you know, we were able the to... The way, on this budget, the way we did. Duck into any airport, mm -hmm. and, you know. Didn't you shoot at Midway also? Yeah, we shot at Midway. I think we shot... There is my daughter, Eleanor, yeah. and my mother-in-law, right there. Mm -hmm. My Eleanor just started high school today, so there you go. Oh, wow. Yeah, so... <laughs> Time I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> and there's my wife, Monica, as the stewardess, so mm -hmm. it's a family affair. And you're in the second one with your I'm daughter. in the second one. In the toy shop. Yes, having looked as if I'd eaten most of New York City at the time. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was enjoying myself. <laughs> um, Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this uh, was one of the funniest shots I remember when, when people first saw... Uh, you open that door and your hair was all sort of... Because usually in movies people don't think about, well, we're going to mess up his hair to look like he actually had a night's sleep. People yeah. wake up and they look like... Lindas, the Lindas. Yeah. Hair and makeup. Scratch my butt. That was, a, that was a, in the script, actually. That was a John Hughesism. <laughs> it was very, John was very, uh, very perceptive and um, the script read wonderfully. You know, it was like, it was a movie on paper, essentially, and you realized well, this had a lot of potential. Uh, someone I got to work with, Maureen O'Hara, on a picture uh, right after this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did a day on that. Yeah, we cut your we cut your big you, scene. You, cut, you cut all my lines out. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like we were trying to duplicate Uncle Buck. Yeah, I remember yeah. that, and it was just kind of felt like we were we had been there in a sense. Um, more people saw this picture, though, so you're okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm... <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> now this, uh... <laughs> Once again, we resorted to stock footage for any, any shots you'll see of airlines coming up, shots of Paris. We had no money to go shoot those things, and uh, this was a set that already existed that we put back together so we could actually shoot. Um, the, um, this is first class when you could actually have real silverware on the plane. Yeah. yeah. Uh, most of our sets, incidentally, were in a... Uh, a lot of them were in a high school in, yeah. outside of Chicago. Um, we shot Uncle Buck there, too. New Cheer High School. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, some of the sets were... I'm trying to remember where the house set was. We were in some warehouse somewhere, weren't we? Or was it this New Cheer as well? Was this I think, in the I gymnasium? Think it was, yeah, it was, all, it was all in that school, all, all in that the gymnasium. interiors. Yeah. We also shot a lot at the house, uh, at the real house, oh, yeah. during this one. The second one, I think we spent half a day That's in the true. real house. Yeah, because they, the people who own the real house wanted a little more money in the second one. Yeah. Everybody wanted more money in the second one. And rightly so. Me included. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was, uh, you know, it was interesting. Every time we, we preview the film, film used to be much, not much longer, but uh, significantly 10 minutes, which in, in a film like this. In a kid's movie, yeah. And it, there was a lot of you looking around the house, looking for, uh, and it just, uh, we, we just needed to tighten it up. This, this was a sequence that was really harmed really, I mean, not not hurt, because it worked in the film, because it wor it, it's really what the genesis of the film was about. But one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted this furnace to, to really come alive, to really chase you across <laughs> the room. And I wanted it to turn into, uh, like, this CG furnace that got up on all fours and chased oh, you wow. to the stairs. And later I'll talk about it. There was a, it, there's a, uh, a fantasy sequence that was going to cost over a million dollars that was cut from the film that I was always depressed about. But see, we ended up putting two guys with strings and a couple of lights because <laughs> we had no money. Uh, but again, it all comes back to your performance because you're the guy who makes this all work because, because of your reactions, because people believe you're in this situation. Mm -hmm. You really ma you, you make all of these things that were a little ropey at the time, to say the least. You make it work like this. Well, I'm glad I could help. Thank you. Look at this expression. This is, uh, this is truly... I remember the audience when they saw you do that for the first time. That was one of the times where they started to burst out laughing. <laughs> and we'll talk about some of the screenings for this film later because 
It was unlike anything I had ever seen. Oh, really? When, when this film was first screened for an audience, it was incredible. I made my family disappear. Kevin, you're completely helpless. No, Kevin, you're with a friend. This, again, was a situation where we didn't have money to do, to, Kevin, to make these people actually appear over your shoulder, so we were, uh, we had a guy... <laughs> who I'll talk about later. His name was Kevin Nordeen, who, li who li literally lived in his mom's basement in Chicago. <laughs> and he would uh, do his visual effects in the basement. He had all this stuff set up. So he would do, we only had like $200 here, $500 here, and he, he would do these effects incredibly cheaply wow. for us. Probably like a billionaire now or something. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> or still living in his mom's basement, one or the other. Well, he did a, uh, later in the film, I'll talk about an effect he did. Now this was this must have been fun for you. This these was are, great. These are the sort of <laughs> well, so I had some people down on the ground there ready to catch me if right. I fell, and they were just covered in popcorn by the end. Now, do you? I mean, uh, on the whole, <laughs> did, did you have? I mean, did you? Did do you remember having fun shooting? Yeah, stuff? I had a lot of I had a lot of fun doing this uh -huh. stuff. Like actually, just I, you know, any time where it's actually getting down to work and stuff like that, I always have a blast. And this was just so much fun. Basically, it was just you know me being a bratty kid, which right. was pretty easy for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Just be very loud and big. Buzz, I'm going through all your private stuff. You better come out and pound me. Now this is uh, this was something that when I read this in the script, I was like, how am I going to take a, a photograph of a of a, of a girl mm -hmm. and not make her feel bad for the rest of her life when this picture pops Wasn't up it on a boy? TV as a guy? Yeah, I, I remember. Really, that. I thought the only way to make a really Frightening looking woman <laughs> is, to, is to cast a guy. I remember he had two pictures. There was a skinnier one and yeah. there was a bigger bigger yeah. one. They were both frightening. Again, I have, uh, because of this film... There was I, a whole speech there. Yeah, the whole, I think that's in the... Uh, we've got outtakes on this DVD, so I think that'll probably be there. But the... Um, I have not let my children uh, ever buy a BB gun. gun because of this movie. <laughs> I had one for a little while. I got taken away. Did you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> was it an airsoft gun or a... Uh... Uh, it was, you know, you could pump it, yeah. and, but, you know, you could, you could shoot pellets out of that thing. Yeah, I don't have that anymore. No. Well, that's good, <laughs> uh, you know. There's a reason why. When we shot, uh, John had written this uh, this movie within a movie called Angels with Filthy Souls, and uh, we actually had to shoot uh, a film that resembled a film from the 30s, which un unfortunately you don't see on TV anymore, and certainly there's not a kid in America who would pop in an old black and white movie in 2007. Yeah. Um, it's just that, uh, you know, Macaulay was a pretty sophisticated guy, the fact that he was watching old movies back then. <laughs> I was very worldly. But kids would do it back then, and, and the interesting thing is we got two Chicago actors, to do this film, and we just studied our old, uh, our old uh, 30s and 40s uh, film noir gangster pictures, and recreated them. And you know, on this budget, it actually worked because we, they were basically cardboard sets and a few lights, uh, creating that old, uh, that old film noir style. And this stuff is great. This stuff is classic. Yeah. <laughs> Keep the change, you filthy animal. Mom! Now, this is the situation. John Hurt was reading this book, and he said, I'd, I'd like to be reading this on screen. We had no rights for the book, and we were... Of course, I got a call from legal, 20th nice. Century Fox, the next day. We, we didn't clear the book, but luckily it was... It was okay. It was all right. <laughs> This is, uh, you know, this is an interesting scene because, uh, again, the comedy, uh, th these two really worked well together. You believe them as a couple, and uh, the comic timing is, uh, is, is really pretty sweet, I have to say. I remember when I watched, like, a lot of the dailies and stuff like that. They would always kind of fool around whenever you, like, you know, you wouldn't yell cut, and they kind of just oh, yeah. they'd keep going a little bit and do some silly stuff. I think they really, you know, again, it was a, it was a kind of, at times it was, uh, it was tense being on the set because a lot of these actors who were so good didn't know why they were there. Mm -hmm. And on the second one, that eased up completely because then everyone felt that they had a responsibility to do something because mm -hmm. they knew a lot of people would see this movie. Now, here's something I always felt <laughs> oh, yeah. pretty horrible about because particularly once you have your own kids, this is the last thing you want them to do. <laughs> uh, this was a big worry, I remember. Oh, yeah. Whether or not this was going to stay or not. Yeah. Um, See, no one really ever understood when I'm lining up the sled that it doesn't exactly line up with the door. No. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, a couple wouldn't... people who watch it who actually kind of giggle. I remember saying, oh, that doesn't line up. How is he going to do that? Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, literally it would have smashed into the wall. Yeah. 
Um, but, but that we, was that was Larry. I remember watching the Daily. That that was just hilarious. Larry, just him, our stunt man. Yeah, stunt man. Literally, he was probably tw no, maybe he was about thirty back then. Yeah. And he was your size. Yeah, he was built like me, too. Yeah. Now, he was amazing. He would do anything. There's one moment coming up later on the film, and we'll talk about Larry where because falls. where he falls. Oh. And he, he kind of froze that day. He didn't want to do it. But Larry had, as most of the stuntmen did in this movie, I don't even know if these types of stuntmen exist anymore. Yeah, Willing no. to kill themselves for... It's amazing. Yeah. I, I have a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of memories of these guys just doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, yeah. They're always my favorite on the set, though, the stunt guys. The stunt guys were great. Yeah, when you're nine years old, they, they can do all kinds of neat stuff. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They were always my best friends. I got it all figured out. We'll talk about, uh, a little later, we'll talk about Troy Brown and Leon Delaney, the two stuntmen for Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern, who were truly, yeah. truly went above and beyond the Call of Duty. Uh, I, I haven't spoken to them in years, but they probably are still in a great deal of pain because of some of this stuff. <laughs> uh, Daniel Stern is interesting because Dan Stern was my first choice uh, for this role, and the studio didn't want to pay him at the time. We cast another actor, unfortunately. This is the only time in my career this has happened. And... Um, we did a screen test with the other actor and Joe Pesci, and the screen test was flat. And the other actor just co couldn't really improvise with Joe, and you didn't believe him in the role. And I had the uh, I had the horrible situation of actually telling the actor I couldn't use him in the movie, basically firing him. You know? Oh boy! Um, and then uh, the studio then understood. They saw the, the the screen test, and they were willing to hire Danny, which. It was really an amazing working situation for me. He's one of the funniest guys I've ever met. Yeah. And he truly was up for anything, as we'll see later in this commentary. You're the king. I still have that sled in my office. Um, oh, wow. In my office here in San Francisco. I just saw it before I came over here. Uh, signed by everyone. Oh, signed wow. Signed by everyone. That's really cool. Yeah, and uh, when I get a little older and things start not working out in the career, I can always eBay. sell it. To, yeah, eBay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the key here was, you know, which which you'll see a lot of in the film, was to go against the traditional concept that comedies have to be shot in a bright way. Mm -hmm. We kept things dark, kept things a little scary, a little sinister, um, which you don't see in a lot of comedies. Uh, you, st you, you still don't. There's this, there's this, in, you know, this this feeling that everything has to be bright mm -hmm. and cheery, and that's that's why I think this film appealed to kids because kids actually, y y yeah, mm -hmm. they're sold on the, mm -hmm. the danger. And the interesting thing is. The uh, when I was a kid, one of the things that scared me more than anything were burglars. Mm -hmm. In Cold Blood was the most frightening movie I I'd ever seen. <laughs> so this this was a movie I wanted to do because of that as well. Now these are situations where you were probably home at this oh, point yeah. watching television. All snug in my bed. Because <laughs> yeah, you only had five hours a day of real shooting yeah. time. Mm -hmm. so Did all... you go to school at the time as well? Yeah, yeah, I had yeah. a tutor and so all that stuff. So uh -huh. you get. It's like 10 hours you only get, and like right. three of those are for uh, school, one mm -hmm. of those is for lunch, and mm -hmm. it's just like, i surprised you guys got anything. Now we are in another, we shot this in another area of, I'll tell you, this is, I can't really remember, this is either Midway or Chicago's O'Hare. Um, but I guess by casting one real French person, it became... It's Paris. Oh, oh. <laughs> We're back in Gay Paris. Paris. I, I wonder how many times you actually hear the phrase in the film, my Home brother. Alone. Home Alone. Yeah, it's... Uh, that might be the only time. Uh, Kristen, right? She went on to do... She, she was on ER for several seasons. Who's... Who, which one? Uh, the tall uh, brunette. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was Angela Gothels. Angela Gothels, she's done a lot of stage. She's still yeah. doing stage work. Yeah, yeah, she's like back to work again and stuff. I think she went to college for a couple of years. Uh -huh. She played my older sister in my very, very first movie also. So that was kind of funny. And what was played, that? What film it was, was called it? Rocket Gibraltar. Oh, right, was, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, Burt Lancaster and a bunch of people. Hey! This is one of those nights where we, did, again, I don't think we were able to shoot with you past 10 o'clock, right? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, luckily we were in the winter, so it was dark in Chicago around 4.30, but... I remember we had one of those days where it was like, it got unseasonably warm. Like it was like oh, yeah. 80 degrees and they were oh, yeah. bringing in trucks ice and oh, like yeah. foam and all that stuff. I just remember that day where we just couldn't keep the, the snow on the ground. When the audience saw you scream <laughs> like this, it was just, it was a roar. They, mm. Because for some reason, you're, you're, you just did, you, your expression was just hilarious. And this we just decided to do for the fun of it and it yeah. actually worked. 
<laughs> why it worked, I have no idea. Again, there's, there's, we start, you know, the stylistically, you looked into the camera a couple of times, and oh, it yeah. seemed to work in this film. It seemed like you could break the rules a few times. He was, he was a good screamer. That Culkin <laughs> kid, I swear, could scream like nobody's business. Let me connect you with Sam's crisis intervention. No, it's not a crisis. Hold on. Larry, can you pick... This was built somewhere in the high school as well. Now, we had to build... In editing this scene, we had to build this entire scene around where this guy's donut fell on the phone. I mean, it sounds like a ridiculous way to, to edit a sequence, but because he was this... Uh, Larry Hankin was such an improvisational actor who appeared in a bunch of John Hughes films. We uh, we were sort of stuck following his cue for this entire scene. You see, this, the donut thing drops on his receiver, mm -hmm. and we had to cut back to him as it fell off. So these are the these are the things that drove us crazy as we were editing this film. Just to check on him. Yes. Let me connect you with the police department. No, they just transferred me to you. Rose. Yeah. Hyper on two. <laughs> Hyper on two. Any luck? No. I was, you know, I, the studio rejected my idea of a sequel, which was years, you know, now, you actually, you being in jail, coming back to take revenge on Joe and Danny, who live in the suburbs next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got their families. They've gone straight. They've gone straight. Got, you're, <laughs> That's great. I, I, I see something there, but they, uh, for some reason, the studio just won't go for it. Crazies. <laughs> Ah, now here is, uh, again, uh, nepotism rears its ugly head once again. This is my father-in-law, who made a career out of being uh, in a lot of my films, still does, actually, um, and he still gets health benefits from SAG, so it's nice. important for him. But uh, he looks exactly the same. He hasn't changed in, in Don't count years. their kids again. <laughs> now we have again one of uh, film and theater's great actresses here. Hope Davis. Well, that's a relief. Everything here is booked. There's nothing to Chicago. I think this is her first film role, and uh, wow. you got a good cast. There. She's obviously not French, but she is. She did a great job. The only thing they have is a booking for all of us on Friday morning. Friday morning. That's two days away. Look, honey, the kids are exhausted. You are and you had Ali Sheedy in the sequel. Ali Sheedy was in the sequel, yeah. Well, we, I think we were piggybacking movies at that point. We were just finishing Only the Lonely, and Ali decided to do it as a favor. You're mixing and matching. Yeah. Cast. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I did uh, a little stint on that one. Ali did a little that. <laughs> okay? Yes. I'll wait. Bills will be ringing. A little bit of the New Jersey influence here. We had uh, one of my favorite bands at the time, which is still still pretty big in England and places like that. Uh, Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes uh, recorded a version of "Please Come Home for Christmas" for this. It was my opportunity to get to work with some people, some great soul singers, and some people I'd always wanted to work with for the soundtrack as well. Cause I'll be happy Christmas once again. And in the end of the movie. She gets there pretty much the same time as the rest of the family does. Right. I mean, maybe five minutes before. Oh, yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, maybe she should have just <laughs> Well, that's waited. the point. That, I think Patience. that was always the point, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we shot two different versions of this, and you guys weren't sure which ones you guys were going to use. What was and that? And ended up you using remember? both. There's this one, and there's the singing one. And but you ended up we... using both. Oh, that's true. Right. I didn't know we shot them as two different versions. We just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There it is. And there it the is. The face that launched a thousand posters. I, I uh, never expected that to be the... It was Joe Roth at Fox who came up with who that. Who came image, up with yeah. that. Yeah. And realized that that should be the iconic post. Oh, here we are. This is Larry's... Larry, our stuntman, who was basically max size, maybe a few inches taller, um, who was 30, who was completely... I mean, Larry was just a very brave guy and a he tough was, guy. He was a pro, yeah. He was a pro, but when he got here to do this particular stunt, he froze that day. This was dangerous, though. And it was dangerous, know? and, I, you know, you have no protection. Yeah, so... Just, it was. Uh, it took quite a quite some time to film. He was fine afterwards, and it's actually, you know, looking at it, it's not one of the more violent stunts in the film. It's but just, it's dangerous. Yeah. Cause it's not like you got like a harness or anything like that. No, 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 no. It was. Uh, There's a Barry Bonds baseball card. Yep. For those who wanted to see Barry in his younger, thinner days. <laughs> um, now this was actually the real house here, which uh, was in Winnetka, Illinois, and. Um, it was it was interesting because we were 
we were able to shoot a, a great deal of, uh, of the film at this house. None of the interiors that you see in the film were shot here. Um, but this, ha this house worked out very well for us. I, I, strangely enough, you know, with today's uh, budgets, we would have built the back of that house completely yeah. because the fact that we did all of those stunts later in the film on the actual location was just ridiculous. Yeah. And they were very friendly, you know, I remember. They, they had little t-shirts made up oh, and everything. Oh, they loved it. They oh, used yeah. to uh, have hot chocolate and stuff for mm -hmm. us and invite us in. And, and they were great. They were a great family. It's always incredible because sometimes I see some of the things that people do to people's apartments and houses, you know, when oh, yeah. they rent them out, like, you know, oh. for, for production. I'm like, I'd never do that. <laughs> no, I know. Once you learn, once you've seen it done, you, you know. Not to discourage any of you guys out there listening to renting out your houses to any future productions. But make sure you're paid very well. Yes. Now, that voice on the answering machine was Raja Gaznell, who was the editor of uh, this picture, who was going on to become a director in his own right. I knew they were silver tuna tonight. <laughs> the kind of stuff that John Hughes would write, I mean, things that I actually hadn't heard, John must have known by talking to people from Chicago. Silver, silver tuna, tuna, the big G, I mean, I mm -hmm. you know, these kind of things. Is this toothbrush by First day of shooting. Yeah. First day of shooting on the picture was this scene. Um, it doesn't say, hon. And we knew we kind of had something... Something special with your performance and just the look of the film. We we did a tremendous amount of setups in one day. I think probably thirty one setups in one day, which was that's a lot. Which was a lot for something that wasn't being done for television. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I love this guy when he says that. <laughs> yeah. It's like a great improvised moment. I don't know. Old man Marley. Roberts Blossom, mm -hmm. who uh, was in several horror films in the seventies, I remember. I worked with him again later on. On some, it was some commercial, some something to do with Ellis Island. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I worked with him pretty much right after this, like uh -huh. about a month after we we wrapped up. Did you guys do something together? Or? Yeah, it was like we didn't speak or anything uh -huh. like that. Yeah, you know, but it was like a part. Like he played my grandfather, and it was like a, it was just something. To do, you know, I think when they reopened Ellis Island after mm -hmm. like for, as like a tourist thing or whatever. But yeah. Which with them right after. This was all shot in the neighborhood of Winnetka, Illinois, on location. Uh, that was one of our uh, lead stuntmen who uh, got his daily work out here. Mm -hmm. Another scene that was shot in a ridiculous amount of time. Again, we had no time to really shoot anything and no, no time to do more than one or two takes. <laughs> it just keeps going. It does, yeah. It's just like... <laughs> Now, I can't for the life of me remember if this was you or the stuntman running across the bridge. Or one, even of, or one of the stand-ins. Right? Yeah. I remember I had like, like ten stand-ins. Oh, that's true. That is true. And so then you guys would do a lot of like just stuff after I go mm -hmm. off or at the same time even. Criminal. I, <laughs> I think this was the first day too. Yeah. Yeah. This entire concept of the wet bandits, I'm trying to remember if that was in the original script or not. I, I, I don't know. or I, I think possibly it was. I thought for some reason I had I have a memory of Dan Stern coming up with it, uh, and I could be wrong. You know, that's why I really wish John Hughes was here, because he could... But Dan, for whatever reason, was, was obsessed with the concept of the wet bandits. The wet bandits. Um, and the sticky bandits. Yeah. <laughs> But this whole look of Dan's, this, this sort of white trash yeah. <laughs> trucker look, is just <laughs> something that didn't catch on, unfortunately. And just the contrast in size between yeah. the two of them, and just height, and uh -huh. just build. But the, uh, all of these were little touches by Dan, which on a movie like this, people you know, don't talk about, don't us, but putting the snow globes from each house, with you know, attaching them. There was a scene on the deleted sequences where Dan wanted to, uh, he stole a cappuccino maker, and they, they share cappuccino in the truck. Yeah. I remember that. I think it was that scene. This was all shot backwards. Oh, yeah. That's right. Coming up here. This. So we, I would scream, then the car would back out, and I would walk backwards. And we did it several times, and yeah. it looked pretty it awful looked, yeah, each yeah. time, and then finally that one shot, it worked out perfectly. Yeah, well, you, yeah you had somebody shaking the, right. shaking the van, right, you know, at the beginning, and I had to walk, like, backwards, like, heel first oh. or whatever. But it works out well, just because it's so close to my face. It's so screaming. fast. Yeah. It's so fast. I didn't like the way that kid looked at me. Did you see that? 
This wardrobe here for these guys, you know, was interesting because we, uh, again, wanted it to be slightly Dickensian. You know, the whole feeling of... It was, this was like a, this movie felt like, for me, like a smorgasbord or a collage of Christmas. Mm -hmm. Everything, every little memory I had at Christmas I wanted to put into the film. So whether it was a snippet of Great Expectations or a snippet of something D Dickensian that I remembered as a kid, uh, whether it's Fagin or something, that's where some of that wardrobe comes from. The, the key to most of the wardrobe in the film, although some of it hasn't aged as well, is that we wanted, wanted it to have a feeling of timelessness. Mm -hmm. So when you watch this picture now, people don't, it doesn't look like, 1990. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are little giveaways here and there, probably mostly in hairstyles of the adults and some of the wardrobe. But, but in that's general. the key. The key was to create something that, that felt fresh 20 years from now. This is one of the points of the picture that always bothered me. But I, got, I, I felt, because it was a comedy at work, these guys, uh, Harry and Marv, say that they're not going to go into the church to find the kid. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> getting into some mysticism here? Are they going to be struck by lightning? I'm not going in there. Me neither. <laughs> but I, 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 well, technically I haven't really done anything to them either. No, I that's looked true. At, I just looked at them weird. I'm not going in there. Me neither. Yeah. Let's get yeah I... <laughs> sure fooled them. guys come back I'll be ready now this was, now that was something that really bugs me about the movie is that was a, a note from someone somewhere in the studio that I, we had to dub dub that line when those guys come back I'll be ready I'll be because ready. it was confusing to the audience why this was happening but I don't remember I remember screenings when that line didn't exist and people were still laughing yeah but this is again one of those areas where the audience was so into it that it was it was hard to hear anything when they when Michael Jordan comes around here when, when people start to see this they started snickering and then as the camera panned up to Michael Jordan it was a roar <laughs> and it never really stopped and then with your dancing yeah, I can, around I can't even compare it to any particular rock star whoever it would be, <laughs> would be whatever that dancing was the, the audience was just into it they were laughing so hard <laughs> Because originally I was playing the piano. That's oh, right. the way it was written. That's right, yeah. And I took a couple piano lessons and it just wasn't working out. <laughs> I forgot about that. That's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. And you guys came up with something much more clever. Well, we had to make it work. That thing you're wearing around your was neck a laugh is thing. a laugh box, which I don't know if people know what those are anyway. Yeah, you yeah. press them and they, they make the sound of laughter. Here we, here we go. The stock shot of Paris. Because no one would pay for us to go and actually shoot that. Another one? No. I don't have and this is another, uh, yeah, like all the Christmas movies, yeah, the you Christmas know, in the background. Movies. Well, this is at a time before It's a Wonderful Life was purchased by NBC. Now It's a Wonderful Life can only be seen once a year. But back then, It's a Wonderful Life was on all every, the time. for like two Miracle, weeks. Yeah, Miracle on in the background earlier. Uh -huh. It's one of those just, you know, gives it the Christmas feel. But It's a Wonderful Life people got sick of because you could see it at any time of the day during the Christmas holidays. This was again shot on a soundstage. Somewhere in Chicago. I don't know if we were at New Trier. Oh, we may have actually rented an apartment and put a um, a slide of Paris outside of the window there. I'm trying to remember. This is so pointless. What? There was a lot of this in the film that actually ended up being cut. First from the script, and then there are a couple of deleted scenes on the film on, on the DVD where we were cutting back to the family. And we found the preview audiences didn't really care that much about the family. <laughs> they wanted to hang out with you. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be in that house and. Uh, we, there was a restlessness to get back there. They wanted to get back there. Time and time again, they wanted to see what you were going to do. No, for three reasons. A, I'm not that lucky. Two, we have smoked. One of John's funnier <laughs> lines. A, two, D? Is it A, two, D? I think so, yeah. <laughs> yep, there it goes again. Um... This guy went on to, this guy who played the pizza guy, I guess moved to L.A. and had a couple of roles and some stuff, but I uh, haven't heard from him since I think we shot I've seen him. him in a couple of things, yeah. Uh -huh. But watching this movie again today, I thought to myself, this was really, you know, you think about how fun it was to shoot the movie. Mm -hmm. And I think that fun translates to, to the screen, because we did laugh a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of laughter, a lot of good times. Get the hell out of here. Okay. 
Um, but what about the money? What money? These would sort of be our split days. Um, we'd shoot you in the morning, the first part of this, mm -hmm. and then later that night we'd go back to the house and shoot. Plus, Which, am I? I think this is the this is the real house, and this is the sound sound stage. Isn't yes, it? exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the um, but it really, in terms of shooting the film, it was possible to shoot it with someone so young because you were separate from, mm -hmm. and that was uh, that was really helpful. And we use this we use this gag twice too. I know, and it worked. It, it seemed to work twice. Oh, that's because Danny Stern just brought it to another level when mm -hmm. he's at the door coming up. So, uh, yeah, we used, uh, because of budget again, we used a lot of Chicago actors. This guy was one, uh, one Chicago actor that we found in the city and then later moved to Los Angeles. A lovely cheese pizza just for me. To Dallas, Fort Worth. Now, people don't really talk like that. They think about those things. Yeah, but they don't actually say it out loud. <laughs> no, I know. This uh, is... Uh, the dangly ones. The dangly ones, yeah. <laughs> now, um, these are two people that John Hughes had worked with in the past. Two mm -hmm. actors. <gasps> that is beautiful. Come on, Irene. They're boarding. Oh, this gal has offered us two first-class tickets if we go Friday. Plus a ring, a watch, a, a pocket translator, $500, and the earrings. You love the earrings. She's got her own earrings, a whole shoebox full of mutt dangly ones. Now I'm dangly confused. ones, there it is. <laughs> Always a quotable... Uh... I'm begging you, from a mother to a mother, please. Oh, Ed, please. Oh, all right. Still one of my favorite lines of the dangly ones. I know. I don't that's know why it, that's a. People that's a still like come up to me and say, say that sometimes. <laughs> dangly ones. I don't know exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> I wonder how many kids who watch this today remember Johnny Carson, which yeah, was a, again boy. a perennial. You know, he was sort of David Letterman and Jay Leno wrapped into yeah. one. But this is also right near the end. I mean, this he only had about two, three more years. That's after true. This. Yeah. yeah. Now, do people still recognize you from the film? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, just, it, come, it comes with the territory. But yeah, you know, it's a curse and a blessing. I have the, I basically pretty much have the same face. Right, just a little bit older. Only a little bit older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's the other one. Look at this. I mean, you have to say you you can't imagine in dailies adults just dying of laughter <laughs> because you were a ham. Yeah, I was I a mean, ham. If you wanted to, I love how I never brush the back of my head too. It's such a child <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> Well, my son said to me that years ago when he saw this movie, he was like, he goes, Dad, it hurts much more to spray your armpits than it does to put shaving yeah. lotion on your face. I, considering I didn't even shave either. Yeah. <laughs> Do we, didn't we do, we were, I think we even shot one of those kind of sequences for the second one. With like an electric razor or oh, something yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we actually never did that gag in the second one, did we? I can't remember. I, you I know, people accused us on the second one of just remaking the first one. Which, yeah. to some extent, we did. I, yeah. I, I, but that it, was what was enjoyable about it. It was know? fun because you actually got to push the envelope a little more mm -hmm. in terms of how painful the stunts could actually be. Yeah, gosh. I mean, if, if he said he could, John Hughes said he could write this on the weekend, I wonder how long it took him to write the second <laughs> one. <laughs> just like a little bit of cut and paste, and boom, you're done. You're there. <laughs> Sequel. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> And I, it's, it was interesting. I have this funny, you know, you, you, you'll sometimes read reviews about films and you'll, people will accuse filmmakers and studios of using product placement. But it's such a difficult question sometimes in movies because if you see orange juice that doesn't look real, then it takes you out then of it. Then it takes you out of it. So it's a very, we had no product placement for any of this movie because no one thought it would do any business. I think the only product placement came later with something called Juicy Juice. Mm -hmm. That was it. I remember um, that. But all of this stuff... Well, I remember when I'm I'm doing the, my saying grace yeah. at the table, and we did one where it's like macaroni and cheese dinner, and the other one was craft macaroni Seriously? and cheese dinner. Yeah, we did we did two different takes of that. Oh my god! Okay, this was scripted. And then at the very very end, you just told her to keep asking questions. Uh -huh. I'm just like, uh, I forgot what it was. <laughs> See, I think you ad libbed that. You're yeah, a stranger. Yeah, yeah. That was. Uh, can't tell you that because you're a stranger. And that got a again a big laugh. Oh, this was good. Day one. <laughs> <laughs> 
had to let go of the I had to let go of the strings on the inside of the bag. Oh yeah, you controlled it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And at the right time, I just let go of the strings, and the whole bottom would fall out. Now earlier, I was talking about the furnace. I had forgotten to mention when you're eating the candy and uh, when you're watching Angels with Filthy Souls for the first time, you fell asleep. And you woke up to the entire house coming to life and chasing you. So uh, <laughs> there were uh, nutcrackers and toy soldiers. And it was a, I would have just been a, a, a sequence I story, storyboarded for months. And the studio said, you don't have enough money to shoot it. Shut up. Conquering my fears. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Your fears of two stuntmen with a flashlight. <laughs> and a couple of strings. <laughs> Again, we're back in that real neighborhood, which probably looks pretty much the same. Pretty much the same today, yeah. Winnetka. Now, Joe used to tell me, I don't know how, how I can tell this story without swearing, but it's an important <laughs> story because he said to me one day, you know how I go through the script, how I do it? I, I look at the script and I look at the, the lines and I'm like, yeah. And he, I said, well, how do, you, how do you memorize the lines? Well, I substitute the F word after every line. <laughs> I'm like, what? So if it says, go into the house, you idiot, I say, go into the effing house, you effing idiot. And I, I develop a rhythm. And I'm like, wow. And then he read me that scene. This whole <laughs> It sounded like it was from a Scorsese movie. Wow. Um, <laughs> Too bad I missed that. Yeah, you, you would have loved hearing that. <laughs> I have to say, you know, sometimes you get... Uh, Critics complain about certain things, but Dan Stern in this scene is so funny mm -hmm. because of his body language. He's like a combination of of a giant bird and a human being, and just the way he reacts in this scene, just, again, it was one of those situations that brought the house down, and the audience was so, you know, you, didn't, you wouldn't have thought that it would, like you said earlier, that this would work twice, this gag, yeah. but he sells it. He sells it. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm going. One... Two, ten. Another improv <laughs> improvised moment again from you here. I remember asking you to just say the line. Yeah, yeah. And I'd go along with the whole thing. Captain in the movie and the audience roared. <laughs> Keep that change, you filthy animal. <laughs> so you're just about ready to laugh there. Yeah, yeah. You can see that. You can see you it were, cut right yeah. before I start oh, yeah. giggling. What happened? I don't know who's in there, but somebody just got blown away. Huh? Somebody beat us to the job. They're in there. Two of them. There was arguing. One of them blew the other one away. Who? I don't know. I thought I recognized one of their voices. Dan is so wonderfully stupid in this scene yeah. that it makes it... Snakes? Snakes. <laughs> makes snakes. it work. I don't know no snakes. Snakes. Sometimes Pesci becomes De Niro. Did you notice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I don't know no snakes. He just became De Niro <laughs> for a second there. I think they spent quite some time together. Yeah. Supposing the cop's finger was for a job. And they start asking us I don't know. You know, I read this article, uh, I think in Premiere, saying, whatever happened to Joe Pesci? And I have no idea. He is now... He came out with an album, I think. I think he came out with a singing album. Seriously? I, like, year, like 1998, 99 or well, something. Well, he like had that. some tasteless record in the 60s, mm -hmm. like the early 60s, called some, Something the Stuttering Donkey or something. Some oh, wow. ridiculous novelty record. So he's, he's got... And supposedly he's in Jersey Boys as a character. Really? play Jersey Boys, yeah. Huh. He's at the beginning. He hangs out with the Four Seasons or something. Now, this, is, this to me is amazing. This happened three weeks ago. I get a call from a guy who's doing a documentary on Elvis Presley. And the guy says to me, we've heard... This guy's convinced Elvis is alive. And he's actually doing a legitimate documentary. He goes, Elvis supposedly was an extra in Home Alone. And I'm like, what? <laughs> awesome. So he sends me this thing that is a huge... See the guy, the, the bearded guy behind the woman in white? Mm -hmm. They are convinced, these people, that this is Elvis Presley. He's come back. He's, he's faked his death. And he was now, because he still loves show business, now an extra in Home Alone. So they've got stills. This guy sent me all these stills oh my God. of this guy with Al, uh, compared to Elvis in this movie Charo. Where they look, look at this guy. He's not Elvis Presley. I remember talking to the guy. But these these people are convinced that that is Elvis Presley. So wow. it's now. It, it may appear in this documentary. And this so. is recent. This is this is a couple of yeah, wow. a few weeks ago. <laughs> but more importantly, forget about Elvis Presley. Yeah, let's look over the other shoulder. <laughs> the other shoulder. Other shoulder. Yeah, there we go. John Candy, who was uh, at the time friends with John Hughes, who later uh, uh, John and I became very close. Uh, he was, I have to say, one of the sweetest guys in the world to work yeah. with, and one of, the, and probably the, the funniest man I, I'd ever met. There's no question about that. He uh, loved 
improvising. He loved trying anything. And his entire supporting role in Home Alone was shot in one day. Yeah. I actually, I came in. It was my day off. I actually came yeah. in to go, to go see him again. And we started at 7 in the morning, and we finished at 6 a.m. So wow. it was a 23-hour day. And I don't know... Uh, I, I just I don't know if I've ever seen that kind of energy from a guy who was big. Uh, John's a big guy. That kind of energy. And he remarkable. liked he liked being on set. He loved working. Mm -hmm. Loved working. Yeah, yeah. We some fairly big hits. But the thing about John was there was a sense of vulnerability that was just so sweet, and that sweetness is I think what made him a big star. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I miss him a lot. He was great. He was just amazing. I see this film and he seems so vibrant, so alive. It's hard to believe he's not with us anymore. See the guy in the yellow jacket over there. Another transportation. I think that yep. was John Hughes' driver there yeah. in the yellow jacket. No, I heard you had some problems here. The Teamsters, man. I love those guys. The Teamsters are great. They, they, they let me be part of the union. They, they got they, me a jacket they, and everything. They, like, <laughs> I was like the local 716 <laughs> or something like that. I got, me and Kira got these little jackets. That is great. Yeah, yeah. It's on the way to Milwaukee. You give me a ride? Sure we will. Why not? You know, you've got to get home and see your kid. A ride to Chicago? Sure. You know, it's Christmas time. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. You, you. you don't mind going with some polka bums. No, I'd love to. Now, I, again, that's another thing that John Hughes would be very helpful for. I don't know if Gus Polinski was a polka king if he was in the original script. <laughs> I can't remember how she got home, but I don't remember it being a polka band. So um, it'd be interesting to go back there and look at those early... Those early drafts. Uh, although, I, I, I don't know if I ever have that kind of time in life. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to go see those old horror Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I do it every day. <laughs> this is all I think about is yes. this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Consumes my being. <laughs> Well, it's always interesting because I always wonder how do you really feel about the movie because it's the thing that, like you said, it's like a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that propelled you to international superstardom in one sense, and then in the other sense, it's this thing. It's it's all not that it's an albatross, but it exists. Yeah, yeah. It's part of your career forever. Personally, I don't think about it. That's no, a good no, thing. No. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just something I did. You know, uh -huh. it's just something I've I've always done. It just happened to be on a, on a bigger scale. Right. Exactly. Really. But you know. It's just the way, you know, just the way the, the, way the whole thing worked out. The way out. the business, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, there was a certain critic in Chicago, this movie, uh, when, when Home Alone was released, it was uh, not favorably reviewed. It, it, it got some good reviews, but some, some people really didn't like the movie. Two people who didn't like the movie, Siskel and Ebert, gave it a two thumbs down. In your face. But uh, <laughs> what was amazing about that is I had to sit there and watch that, watch the, the, the show, and then three weeks later, after the film was this runaway success that couldn't be stopped, I think it was number one of the box office for like 16 weeks, maybe? Something like that, so, yeah, so, a couple months. insane amount of time. So, so then they take the, the late grade, Gene Sisko, I met him, nice guy, but then he was forced to go back to the house and report on where Home Alone was shot. Uh -huh. So after slamming us, he appeared in that window where Joe Pesci was. Joe Pesci poked his head in and he said, this is where the scene was shot. And I thought to myself, uh -huh. well, this is sweet revenge in yep. one sense. Had to go all the way out to Winnetka. Once again, I mean, when you, <laughs> John Candy feels like he's like the fourth lead in the film, mm -hmm. and he's, <laughs> we shot this in a day. This, this particular, these two shots, I mean, any two shot between John and Catherine in the van was, was shot close to four in the morning, four thirty, five. Wow. That's when you get into like third meal hours, you know? Oh, God, yeah. Now, this was interesting. The elf was played by Julio's the then wife, wife of yeah. Julio. Um, I'm telling you, nepotism is a way of life in the films mm -hmm. we do. But I, uh, I, I wrestled with this scene. I remember reading it thinking, well, how, you know, particularly in what, what's about to happen, what are kids going to say when they realize that Santa Claus is smoking a cigarette? He's not, mm -hmm. his beard is, is undone. But he explains it away. Kevin explains really it away. Yeah. Kevin explains it. Because that's something that parents always say to their kids whenever they go yeah. see Santa. It's not really Santa. Santa sends out these workers, mm -hmm. you know. Now, this guy was a Chicago actor. I think he started in Second City. I've seen him in a bunch of stuff since then. He was and in uh, Herman's Head. Yeah, Herman's Head. There yeah. you go. What makes you say that? Just out of curiosity. I think, I think, I, I think I just saw him something recent, too. Mm -hmm. Today, we'd probably cast Artie Lang. <laughs> For this role, in the you know, 70s, it would have been John Belushi. So yeah. <laughs> it, it is, 
It was actually freezing this night, so it uh, we didn't have the uh, now we can add breath wherever we want to digitally, but back then we actually were shooting on nights that uh, where it was so cold. Sometimes it was difficult. I think I remember for you to speak. Yeah. On Home Alone two, the the equipment froze a few times. Yeah. Uh, where we couldn't actually shoot because the cameras broke. Uh, but this was a very very cold night. Again, we were always racing. There was that intense mm -hmm. feeling of we have to get it done a certain time and. Because you had to. We did. Yeah. And that's a stand-in, obviously. With a, with a little little hand, little he, insert. And he's acting with someone standing and next to him. And the car actually broke down. This it, was real, yeah. I remember. Mm -hmm. This wasn't written this way. Son of a... I just remember the whole crew cracking up behind me. Oh, I don't that? know why, and I turned around, <laughs> and the car really stalled. And we didn't think, uh, I didn't know if it would make it into the film, but it was... It was great, great yeah. and he, he ran with it. It was great. Now, again, this is, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a certain level of obvious sentimentality in this film. Um, but it, it's one of the things that holds the film together, because I think people are willing to... If you watch Home Alone in the summertime... It's a nice movie, but if you watch it at Christmas time, for whatever reason, it these these images tend to resonate a little more, and they feel mm -hmm. a little more touching. This particularly for me was was one of the things that fascinated me about doing the film. There's my I was about to little say. nephew Bob. <laughs> I was about to say, you no, gotta I have some family have there. More family. <laughs> but uh, it's one of those things that really attracted me to the to the film, which was this idea of loneliness at this time, because mm -hmm. it's not just about being happy and being with your family. It's about being separated at the mm -hmm. same time. And I love I loved that concept. And I love the fact that there's a touch of darkness, you know, in this movie. A lot of people, this is the scene coming up. Is there, it, personally, it's, it's my favorite, favorite scene in yeah. the film as well. Um, I remember I fell asleep in the pews. <laughs> Did you really? I totally, yeah. This was, this was late, I remember. We're getting late in the day. And I actually fell asleep in the pew. Yeah, it's a completely different... This church, we didn't use the interior of this church for the church. Uh, the interior of the church is uh, somewhere in Oak Park, Illinois, where the Robert Altman's film The Wedding was shot. This is where The Wedding was shot. Again, I, you wanted to capture, Julio Macat did a wonderful job lighting this scene. Yeah. You wanted to capture the, the sort of the glory and the... wanted it to feel a little scary, too, inside the church. You know, it's... Beautifully lit, but it's still kind of, particularly when he's looking at the statues. Church was always always felt that way to me. It had this it's this love hate relationship where mm -hmm. it's a little frightening as well. You will burn in hell for yes. all sake. <laughs> Thinking impure. What did you say about the church? <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we had a huge uh, battle with this church because I think it was a, I think it's a Protestant church, and we wanted to bring in statues, and they you know. They don't like statues. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I, you know, well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not being clear about the denomination. <laughs> I just want it to be frightening. It's like, what do you mean church is frightening? Yeah, exactly. exactly. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean statues frighten you? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad thing. But it, is, it sets up this whole thing of Marley coming yeah. over in there suddenly. Again, slight Dickensian uh, reference to his name. I don't think his name was... I, again, don't think Old Man Marley was in the original script. I could be completely wrong, but I think Old Man Marley developed through several Just meetings time. with John, and yeah. I don't think he was in the first script that I read. That's my granddaughter up there. The little red-haired girl. She's about your age. Now, at this point, you think that Marley's actually trying to set him up with the granddaughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they should go to the movies together. <laughs> so, the film takes on a whole different meaning. A lot of things going around about me, but none of it's true. Okay? Been a good boy this year? I think so. You swear to it? No. Yeah. You, you know, it's interesting. In a film like this, which is a highly, you know, at times over-the-top comedy, you play this scene very straight. And I have to hand it to you. You really did. You came in and you knew all your lines this day, which is hard. I now have a... You were, what, nine? Nine, You say yeah. you're eight in the movie, but I think you were nine when I we shot I was actually nine when we shot it, yeah. Um, and I have a nine-year-old, and I wouldn't be able to uh, convince her to, to be able to memorize a three-and-a-half-page speech. Well, that's, the, that's what they're looking for in child actors, though. They Really, yeah. the first thing that they look for is can they remember their lines. Right. And, you know, it just... But you have a certain easy. relaxed quality, you know, you don't, it doesn't feel like... How you feel about your family is a complicated thing. Well, you're not just saying words. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. Deep down, you always love them. But you can forget that you love them. 
And you can hurt them and they can hurt you. And that's not just because you're young. What's amazing to me is the audiences who watched this film for the first time we were previewing it, I was, I was a little concerned whether or not they would sit and watch this scene. Mm -hmm. And this is not the kind of film that they expected to see this type of a scene, and no one would leave the theater. They watched it. They were, they were mesmerized. And i got to say, one of the biggest laughs in the film is coming up about the dinosaur pajamas. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a brilliantly written John Hughes line, and it was it just, again... You need this, though. Yeah. You need this scene in this movie. Yeah. Especially right before it just gets so mm -hmm. silly. And I said I didn't care to see him anymore. Did you ever see the Seinfeld episode where George is... He's, he's, like, uh, Jerry comes to pick him up and he's watching Home Alone and he's crying. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I realized. Yeah, she needs a little heart. Needs yeah. a little heart. Aren't you a little old to be afraid? You can be a little old for a lot of things. You're never too old to be afraid. That's true. I've always been afraid of our basement. Start. Now this, uh, interestingly enough, I think if I if I were shooting this picture today, the only thing I'd do differently is I'd shoot it in widescreen. And it still looks great in 185. Julio Macat did a, a wonderful job. And uh, but again, I think I'd shoot it in widescreen. Again, though, it would be a, I think part of the charm of the movie was because we didn't have a lot of money, mm -hmm. and we made it work. It has a real hands-on feel. It, there are no computers involved, nothing. It's just and plus, if you were shooting today, it'd be really weird because I'm like 26 now, so <laughs> that'd be really crazy. My parents leave home. I'm like I'm throwing a party or something. That's true. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not, no I'm excitement still, whatsoever. Yeah, I'm still living in my my parents' basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they forgot to take me to France. <laughs> Darn. I sent her a check. But it'd be in widescreen. It would be in widescreen. It would be in widescreen, <laughs> but the age thing would have been a problem. Oh, well, that's nice. Not for a guy in the second grade. You can get beat up. You know, they originally, the concept was originally, I proposed it to the studio, and they didn't want to do it at the time, which, again, hurt their chances of making millions of dollars to shoot Home Alone 2 and 3 back to back. Because mm. John had an idea for 3, and we, we said, let's do it. Let's just do... Especially with... With puberty aging. coming up. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's basically how we're still shooting those Harry Potter movies. Those guys are not getting a break. Yeah. So imagine shooting. That's why you don't see them in anything else, you know? No, you can't. You, exactly. Yeah. You and your son. Oh, in this day and age, this movie, there would be four of these. They would have, they would have come up with that concept. See, look what we started. Look, I know. What, look what we started. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and now that there's no end to them. Again, when I first heard the John Williams score with this film, it just it just brought it to life in a way that I had never imagined. It is what he does for a living. It is, yeah. <laughs> but he does it so much better than anyone else. That is true. I have to say, he is. He never misses. Master. He yeah. never ever misses. I have to defend it. Woohoo! Again, I'd never seen people react to that. People were so... They were engrossed in ...excited thing, yeah. about what was about to happen, which isn't... It's so kind of silly and fun, but they... People really got into it. I spent all that time making that little map. Oh, that's right! With those crayons, right. you know? <laughs> that is your... That's your map, right? Apparently. Did you... You know, but I mean, did you draw oh, I'm not sure. I, I think they actually did. They kind of gave me something when yeah. I was messing yeah, out. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm just saying, though, like, why did Kevin spend so much time making a map? When he knew what he was going to do. Yeah, he knew what he was going to do. He knows the, where the house is. Yeah. He knows where, yeah. I wonder where the stairs are. Let me check my map. Now you, you know? found the ultimate logical <laughs> hole in this picture. <laughs> Boom. I just shattered the reality of this picture. <laughs> the thing about, um, something I still talk about with people is, wh why did the film, why was it successful? Why was it number one for so many weeks? It's because back then we didn't live in this mentality of, of, you know, having f the film open in 4,000 theaters and making sure everyone could see it whenever they wanted to. This film people had to wait in line for yeah. and people couldn't get into the theaters. Because it came out in less theaters than Rocky. I remember Rocky came out yeah. the same day and Rocky was in twice as many theaters as yeah. us. So we sold out all our theaters, which was advantageous in two ways. It was a comedy, so the theaters were packed and mm -hmm. people were laughing and it made the experience so much more exciting. And it meant that some people couldn't get in 
and it created this excitement about mm -hmm. going to see the movie. Now you can't get that. Every there's a sense of greed. Everybody wants all their money on the first weekend, and it disappears. And it's really, you know, it's, it would be really exciting to figure out how to do it again. How to do something like this again. Well, you do this, and then it happened again with Titanic as well. Yeah. Um, and it happens occasionally, but you just don't get that sense of repeat business. People were seeing this movie five and six times, and it's because of that experience. It's because of, that's why DVD will never, ever be the first choice. It's yeah. because there's a, there's a sense of communal experience watching a film. Here's your Kraft macaroni yeah, and cheese I was that just, I, Yeah, I didn't hear it. I don't think I used the Kraft one. No, I wouldn't let that happen. Yeah. I, <laughs> as much of a product whore as I've been accused of being, I don't think I would, I would ever... I'm sorry, for the, the children, a product slut. <laughs> uh, you got a goddamn dirty mouth. <laughs> Radio edit. Now, this is a situation where um, it just proves that an old joke always always works, and a shot to shot. the groin just is, you know, just the... It's timeless, really. <laughs> it's timeless. <laughs> it's Santa Claus, and it's Elf. We're not going to hurt you. No, no. Got some nice presents for you. Be a good little fella now and open the door. Now, this is a situation where Kevin Nordine in his basement painted the BB gun on a few frames. The BB, the BB itself, not the gun. So that was the actually hand-painted. Wow. Cost us $600. Wow. And he just did it paint frame by frame? Frame by frame. Wow. It was like, it was like film school making this movie. Mm-hmm. That was the key. Some, some reviewers at the time, some people complained that the film was too violent. You know? but yeah, that I remember is, that. I think that's what made it funny to adults as well as kids is because there's this theory about soft comedy and hard comedy and I'll talk about it in a bit but it's like when it hurts the more it hurts the funnier it is yeah. it's and three stooges it is, th it is three stooges it is and uh, I was always reluctant to say I was inspired by the three stooges because I was more inspired by the Marx Brothers but nevertheless when you see the three stooges you realize it is that kind of pain and, and it's that, funny it's funny today it's yeah. fun it just it's there's something about people getting hurt mm-hmm now these are the, these are our stuntmen. This was just Leon and the the hook. Did you try to get the crowbar to fall at the right oh, time? Yeah. I remember this. It's one of those things like the like the donut in the phone. Oh, yeah. Try to get the crowbar to uh. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but our stuntmen went above and beyond the call of duty. There were times when I actually thought that they were not going to wake up, and this particular stunt coming up, I thought this this guy is not alive. Oh, I just couldn't believe that that Troy was capable of doing something like that. And he'd get up and he'd say, "How how are you? I'm fine." Oh, they're totally. They always, I remember he got when we were doing the second one. He got run over by a taxi. Yeah, we were. I was running across the street and they were chasing me, and a taxi upended him, and his head hit the windshield and put a big old net in it. Uh huh. And he kind of just shook it off, said he was okay, because that's what you said when you're something, man. You're always okay, even when you're not okay. You always <laughs> say, yeah, "I'm cool. Don't worry about it." And then we gave him about ten minutes, and he, he was ready to go again. <laughs> but no matter what, they're always going to say they're fine. Oh yeah, it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, this is Dan came uh, up with that gag great. himself. <laughs> He's trying to break into Dan the Dan said, I've got an idea. And he came up with that gag, and the audience, again, loved it. But this gag coming up, um, I cannot remember what it was in the script, but it was something that wasn't, again, painful enough. And it's that sick thing where we always wanted it to be more painful. And I was sitting having breakfast with, at uh, my in-law's house, and my brother-in-law is sitting there with me, and he said... I said, I'm trying to come up with this thing that he pull, that Dan Stern's character pulls through a laundry chute. And my brother-in-law said, well, irons hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and then leave a neat mark. <laughs> well, he, didn't, he didn't follow it with that, but that's, yeah. that's where this came from. Um, again, you can understand why an Academy Award winning actor would be a little concerned that he's doing something like this at mm -hmm. this stage in his career. But... Uh, it's it's important to always get back there and remember how much fun you had doing these mm -hmm. these kinds of goofy silly things. This is our little homage to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's, he's going back down the stairs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You 
were having a great time. <laughs> yes, I all I can say is you having fun. All right, Mac, this is what you do. Yeah. You, you're standing at the door. You cheer, you go yes, you just burn his hand, and then you run off the screen. And action. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been worse. Now this, audiences screamed in pain. Mm -hmm. First they all screamed, and then they released it with laughter. Yeah. Dan, of course, sells this to a point where you actually feel like he's really in total pain. <laughs> he just gives up on the front door. Yeah, now this, <laughs> this was a gag because we didn't have, uh, we certainly had no access to ILM or any money at this point. This was all done with mirrors. There was a mirror in the camera, and it actually ma made the flame look as if it was, uh, you know, Whoa. frying Joe. This is Troy the stuntman. And then, of course, we go back to Joe here. I still, you know, have this lovely prop of this fake head. I actually had the hand, the model that they made Did the you? M hand on. It's probably somewhere, some well, box somewhere. Fake head's slightly obscene looking, so you don't want to keep it around. Yeah, you don't, you don't keep it in the living room. <laughs> no. Yeah. You get the point that these actors thought at the time, well, no one's ever going to see this, mm -hmm. so I can get away with doing whatever I want at this just, point. Just getting silly. And uh, it added to their willingness. Dan is wearing huge rubber feet here. Yeah. Now, if you actually look closely, you can probably you see can them. You can see that, because I remember we brought them back for the second one. Uh -huh. When we were going to do that, there was a whole different sequence in the beginning of that one. And we brought back the original feet, and we, we were looking at it like, did we actually use those? <laughs> I, know. I can't believe we used those. Because there's no way you're going to have them walking around with his bare feet in the snow all night long. No. Now, this is, a, this is a, uh, an example of a joke that didn't work during the screenings. It got, you know, ch slight chuckles. Mm-hmm. And again, it's because it was soft. It was because it was... It wasn't... You'd, you'd see this, you know, it's a slapsticky moment that's just okay. But it's not the bang. No, know. it's not that harsh, like, what's coming up here, mm -hmm. where Dan insisted... Now, here he's not wearing rubber feet. He insisted on stepping on these... Granted, they were candy glass, but still candy glass has yeah, the ability yeah. to cut your feet and hurt. And he decided... He absolutely he insisted. He wanted to do it on his own. And then he insisted on walking across the glass. So we had two cameras on him. One, to get these great moments. And another improvised moment by Joe and Dan here. Why are you dressed like a chicken? Why the hell did you take your shoes off? Why the hell are you dressed like a chicken? Dan is so sincere in his mm -hmm. stupidity. It's, it sells it. It makes it work. Micro machines. You guys give up or you're thirsty for more? <laughs> now that, <laughs> that is a completely improvised line. I yeah. don't think that was not in the script. And I think you, uh... Yeah, thirsty for more. Ended up in the trailers. Here we go it's with... Classic. Classic moment. Dan's face right before his head. He, he thought about how stupid he would look. <laughs> yes. I'll never forget how hard I laughed this night. <laughs> I love in the second one. You see, that, that just, when we had the second one, we got the can and the can and the Oh, yeah. Because originally it was going to be two more cans. Oh, yeah. It's just going to just keep on raining cans <laughs> on them. <laughs> I just love, like, thinking about how dumb do I want my face to look before it gets smashed in the face with a paint can. Oh, yeah. Just the little things you had to think about on the set. Home alone. That's me being an adult. I sound just like that now, don't I? <laughs> you now, actually... <laughs> now that I grew into my voice. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? I was dead on. Well, there's a moment. If you freeze the film as Joe Pesci flips, you can actually see the stuntman Troy's Troy. face through the magic of DVD. But don't do that. No, no, no. Don't. It ruins the magic of the film. Yeah. The, uh, this Dan Stern willingly today again... This would be added digitally. He agreed to have this spider put on his face for one take. Yeah, it wasn't even my hand. And he couldn't really scream. He's, he's not screaming. He's, he he's just miming it, and we added it later because it would have frightened the spider. That's how concerned we were. Jeez. Again, um, I have to say, comedically, another favorite moment of mine when Dan is about to hit Joe with his crowbar coming up. <laughs> See, this is, again, film works so well, I think, for kids because it's wish fulfillment mm -hmm. again it's like every kid's dream is to be able to do this 
But if they tried at home, like, the consequences yeah, could be don't, dire. Don't, don't do, do that, that, kids. What are you doing, this boss? is great. Just the way he says, don't move. Don't move. <laughs> he, he's committed to this role. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Marv, what are you doing? Come on. This is the Michael Jordan post in the background, mm -hmm. put back together. Uh huh. He's a crafty little kid. <laughs> yes. That Kevin. Where is it? That was Joe's. Uh, that was, uh, I saw that side of Joe a few times. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's Larry, the stunt Larry. double. Larry. Looking very much like Larry in this particular print <laughs> of the movie. <laughs> we got away with murder in the yeah. early 90s. Oh, yeah. Back in the olden days. Yeah, when you, uh... Back when we made movies. <laughs> we have no fancy-dancy computers. Where'd he go? Maybe he committed suicide. May now, that was a Dan ad-lib. Maybe he committed suicide. Which... <laughs> <laughs> of course he did. Just what he wants us to do. is to go back downstairs through his funhouse so we get all tore up. <laughs> <laughs> This movie's funny. I never realized how it was funny. Yeah, well, it's those moments. <laughs> those moments in there for the adults oh, as well. Are you afraid? Um, I'm kidding. I mean, I always realized it was funny. No, well, I, I honestly don't know how actors can actually watch themselves on screen. I always ask actors. Well, it's different for me, like, yeah. watching this, considering... Yeah. It's years ago. Yeah. It was so long ago. But you have to admit you were a cute kid. I, I, I was pretty cute. Yeah, you were a cute yeah, kid. Yeah, yeah, you see why you got jobs? Yeah, I can see why. I can see why. Now, this... Uh, this is right during the, during the screenings. Was, this was about the point where it, the film, at, right after this gag, we were out of that moment of nonstop laughter, and it was a, an incredible roller coaster ride from when this began and you got to this part. Mm -hmm. It was just so much fun to see this with an audience. I'm trying to remember if this was one of the warmer nights. It certainly looks like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think this snow is, uh, I remember in Home Alone 2, we added snow in Central Park. Yeah. We spent $60,000 to add snow, and then we had a blizzard that weekend. Yeah, nice. So we <laughs> we complete waste of money at that point. <laughs> you this know, is when it was starting to melt, by the way. You can see on the yeah. streets there. You know, they had meteorologists and stuff like that. that, that but that back then, they weren't now. as... Uh, <laughs> back in the old day, <laughs> they weren't as clever. meteorologists. <laughs> Our weathermen couldn't predict more than a day in advance. There he is! Hey, I'm calling the cops. Wait, 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 wait. He wants us to follow him. I got a better idea. Come on. Now, this shot coming up, ironically, this is was, the last day, was our last day of shooting. And uh, we had, we, this set was built in the school swimming pool. Mm-hmm. I do remember so, that. So <laughs> we utilized every part of this particular high school. Hiya, pal. We outsmarted you this time. Get over here. Okay, this one he's about to bite my finger. Now, how is it possible that he, he almost bit it through was, your it, finger? It was just a rehearsal. I mean, he didn't bite through it. I mean, he just so left. still have a scar. I still got a little scar there. Yeah. But it was only in the rehearsal. It wasn't in the take. Now, Marley here, here's a really poor uh, example of stuntman. The stuntman who hits... Oh, it looks nothing like it. It's just like a 14-year-old guy. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of the things on a low-budget film you can't control. So he was a good stunt man. Unfortunately, he was still in high school, <laughs> pretending to be a 75-year-old guy. Um, this was uh, this was an interesting addition from in the in the temp musical score. Uh, I used "Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas," and John Williams said, "What do you think of Mel Torme re-recording it?" And it was that's just such a great idea and. Uh, Mel Torme, obviously, is one of the greats. You know, mm -hmm. on, a, on a par, some people think with Sinatra and Tony Bennett and those guys. So it's just a wonderful uh, little addition to the film. Hey, you know, we've been looking for you two guys for a long time. Yeah. Well, remember, we're the Wet Bandits. Wet Bandits. Shut up! <laughs> Come on. The edge of the head, pal! Come on. That guy's a Chicago actor who is going on to do countless TV work. And uh, so here, here we have Mel Torme singing Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. I love this moment in the film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> you were having fun. <laughs> Again, the, um, 
that 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 sort of sense of poignancy of being left alone mm -hmm. was important for this movie to work. And uh, I have to say, your, your ability as a as a dramatic actor here, and a, you know, people take it for granted because it's it's perceived as a kid's movie, but really. There's a real sense of loneliness here that I, I love this shot. I just mm -hmm. love that. A merry little Christmas night. I'm a bad parent. I'm a bad parent. You're not. And here we are, John Candy improvising at 5.30 in the morning. Like, like virtually the entire scene? Yeah. This is all completely out of John's head. I mean, I had to let J J after John did this. I had to let him go home, and then we shot the these guys because I had no idea that. Let's just hope none of them write a book. But the uh, interesting thing here is John and Catherine bringing their years of Second City improvisational skills to this particular scene, and it just—it's just really. And it's so, so it's so subtle. It is so yeah. subtle, yeah. once. Yeah, it was uh, it was terrible too. You know, I was all distraught and everything. You know, the wife and I, and we left the. The little tyke there in the funeral parlor all day, all day. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> there he was. Apparently, he was there alone all day with a corpse. <sighs> yeah, he was okay. You know, after six, seven weeks. <laughs> it just makes me really sad to, re mm -hmm. to, to think. You know, there's, you're not gonna have an opportunity to work with him again. Mm -hmm. And it was. Uh, he had so many more films. And it was. It was sudden. It was very sudden. Yeah, it's completely. Shocking, really. Again, uh, you know, brightening the film here, adding those those uh, those intense Christmas those colors trends. everywhere, and the snow, which is so such a cliche, but so important for mm -hmm. this particular film. And we used uh, back then again no digital snow. We were, uh, we had to use potato flakes. Mm -hmm. So after about three takes, we had mashed potatoes all over the ground. Mashed potatoes on the ground and yellow mashed potatoes. Potato mm -hmm. flakes have a tendency to turn yellow, so it was not a pretty snowfall after after a few takes. Those are some of the original Nutcrackers that were supposed to come to life in the film, but we'd have to see that in another film. Again, you can see the fans blowing, you know, mm -hmm. wildly blowing the snow. This is one of the better practical snowfalls I've done over the years. It actually worked. Nowadays, if it's not working, you just say, oh, we'll fix it digitally. We'll, we'll, go we'll to do Ireland. it in post, as yeah. they say in the, in the biz. <laughs> <laughs> now, there was another scene here with John and uh, Catherine that I wanted to shoot, but I didn't have time. Them saying goodbye to each other. So That was only if you had 24 hours. 24 with hours with John. <laughs> But no, and he was paid a grand total of $150. Yes. We draw the line. 23 <laughs> or nothing. There is such a, uh, I have to say again, to commend you as an actor at such a young age, the look on your face when you see your mother is just, is exactly... What a kid, and John had written this. It's exactly what a kid would do. Anger at first, you know, you're angry because she left you, she abandoned you, right? And you just did it. You did it beautifully. I think this really sums up why you were, you had such a great career. Oh, well, and thank you, you will continue to have a great career. Yeah, that that old career. The old. Career. <laughs> well, that, you cannot be considered a child actor. Yes, anymore, that so. is true. Look at well, you. Well, thank you. you. Just, um, and it was the emotion that I think, aside from all the laughter in the film. I think the emotion really brought people back. You know, mm -hmm. people... Got George Costanza crying. It got, yeah, got George Costanza <laughs> crying. <laughs> Baby, they couldn't come. They wanted to so much. No, I didn't fall asleep in that. There's a chance that, in your theory, which is ridiculous, really, yeah. <laughs> that she could have been stranded. <laughs> the parents got home from, yeah. from Paris earlier. Yeah. And they actually got to relax in Paris for a day or two. They're all right. I love it. You okay? Hey, Kev. It's pretty cool that you didn't burn the place down. Wait till you see a room, though. <laughs> and I have had studios come up to me for years saying, well, we want the film to end poignantly, and then you have to give us a, a what they call a button, so there's mm -hmm. something big and funny that happens, just yeah, like right in Home Alone. End. You can't duplicate that. Yeah. We duplicated it in Home Alone, and too. And the second one. <laughs> but you can't always have that moment of poignancy and then that big laugh. And that laugh at the end. And milk, eggs, and fabric softener. No kidding. 
I'm a funny guy. What else did you do while we were away? I love how the family never finds out all that stuff he did. It's true. They never. They have no idea what he did. Well, we missed the between the, the two movies. I'm sure he talked Maybe. about Harry and Marv. Maybe they don't believe him. I don't exactly. But there was that sequence at the beginning of the second one where mm -hmm. it was actually me cleaning up the house. Oh, that's right. At like cleaning up all the micro machines oh, that's right. and stuff like that. Yeah. Now, in the original script, this did not exist. The oh, movie, the tooth. No, none of it. The movie ended with just hung around. Oh, Laughter, really? freeze frame, boom, home alone. Marley, now, I'm convinced, was an added character, and hey, we added him throughout the course of rewriting the script. And to me, it solidifies the movie. It, worked, you know? yeah. it really solidifies the point It'd of the movie. It'd be a different movie. And uh, uh, coming up is my favorite shot in the film. That was when he looks over. No, well, y you're close oh, up yeah, as yeah. you're... And then um, Buzz yelling. But I do remember talking you through this scene, because I was mm -hmm. off camera telling you to think about something that was happy. I can't even remember <laughs> what I was telling you to think about, but I was trying to make you laugh or think about something that was happy. But your performance is so good there. It's so genuine. And uh, oh. it just really works. And, you know, it's a, it's a combination, the visual, your performance, mm -hmm. Robert's performance there, and, and John's score, which is really... Mm -hmm. And here comes the button. Very special. Here's the button that studios talk about. Kevin! What did you because do? Because for some reason they're convinced. They, they attach a number to everything, so for some reason that added a certain amount of money to the box office. That button. <laughs> Forget about the <laughs> that, two hours that of That single procedure. line made us $200,000. <laughs> now, in today's, uh, today's uh, filmmaking environment, these credits would be accompanied with outtakes, which, oh, as yeah. you've seen, it just completely cheapens the film. Yeah. We didn't do it back then. We had some integrity yeah, back, we, in, the, back we in the had early some 90s. Dignity. Now we'll do anything, but back then we had integrity. Back in our day. <laughs> All right, well, that was fun. It was nice to be living out with you. We'll have to do it again in another 20 years. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> when we're bitter. Yeah, when we're really jaded <laughs> and haven't seen the movie in God knows how long. <laughs> Guys, thanks a lot for listening to uh, our, uh, I, you know, we would, uh, I think Mac and I, if we did this again, it would be completely different because there's so many things to remember once yeah. you've seen the film a couple of times. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys very much for, uh, you know, listening to the commentary. And uh, next time maybe we'll find John Hughes and put him on this commentary. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs>